worry about this. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
started. Um, this is actually a, a true combined rounds because uh, Dr. David Raven is going to be co-hosted today by myself uh, and Dr. O'Sullivan. Dr. Raven is a radiation oncologist, profession, professor of uh, radiation oncology in the University of Colorado, um, Denver. I actually know David because he has a twin and uh, I met him and then the next minute I saw another guy that looks like him and said, Hey, how are you? And he totally ignored me. So I decided this is the rudest man on earth until I found out that he is actually a very nice guy. And uh, David is uh, very much involved in uh, the combination of radiation and targeted therapy. And uh, he, he really is, is uh, as a, it's a out of the box thinker and uh, hence the title of his talk. And I think he's going to Show us some insights in, term, in terms of where he thinks the field should go in the next uh, five years for us in head and neck cancer. David? Well, that was an interesting introduction. Um, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> well, she, you know, she wanted my CV, um, but I, I was at a meeting and I, I gave a talk in Zimbabwe. I'm part of this, uh, which I'm going to try to rope these two into. It's part of the ASCO ambassadorship program to teach head and neck cancer, multidisciplinary cancers around the world. And, uh, and this uh, wonderful lady pulled out my CD and, and went on for I don't know how long. And, and all of a sudden, I realized, you know what that means? When somebody gives you a long introduction, it means you're old. <laughs> so I want the, I like the, hi. And so anyway, and yes, I have an identical twin brother who's a radiation oncologist as well. Um, uh, we uh, have a, my father was uh, chairman of radiation oncology uh, for about 25 years at Wake Forest University. And, Really actually did some of the seminal work in head and neck cancer, but also in just sensitivity of lymphocytes to radiation way back uh, in the 70s. And so, you know, it's fun to actually go back to look at the stuff he did way, way back and realize, wow, it really does have a lot of significance to what we're doing now. So I have had a couple espressos. I have a cup of coffee. Hope you guys have ramped up because I'm going to go... I've got a lot to talk about, a lot to get through, so uh, hopefully it won't be boring, and hopefully uh, we don't, I don't overwhelm you with everything. Let's see what I do with this point. There it is. So, uh, so I want to thank the, 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 uh, the, the giants of our field uh, and, and, and give them due credit here, because, you know, I mean, you guys don't toot your horn enough. I don't think you, maybe you don't realize, or maybe you do realize what the words Princess Margaret Hospital means to everybody in the United States in terms of the achievements that you've accomplished in, in cancer therapy and, and, of course, in radiation oncology. I mean, it's just been unbelievable uh, what this group has been able to accomplish. And, and I, I'm, I'm kidding her because, and, and these guys heard last time at dinner, you know, she's seven months ago, she was nailing me down for this date. You got to come, what, what are you doing? Are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? We got to get the dates. We got to get this done. We got to get the airline flights. Is this okay? Is that okay? What's your title? We need your CV. And literally, a week ago, by the way, you have to leave right after your talk. <laughs> <laughs> or right, right during your talk. I've got to go to Boston. So, so that's why I did it. Anyway, okay. So, um, I don't know about the residents here, but this is one of my favorite movies of all time Animal House. Uh, which almost ruined my career in college when I saw this right before I went to school, and I'm not going to tell you mine. Um, but I, sometimes I feel like I'm still in a, a, a dark closet spinning around, and I'm, I'm trying to find the light. And I think I'm starting to see the light, and it's in three areas that I'm really passionate about. Uh, one is DNA repair. One is TGF-beta. And, and that might be the most interesting yin-yang thing for us to do in radiation oncology because it's, its form is a radio protector. 
when you block TGF beta, but also we know that TGF beta is intimately involved in the whole immunologic process and the whole inflammatory process and driving uh, what we think is a, a major driver of head and neck cancers as well. And finally, the immunotherapy story that everybody is you know, jumping on board for right or for wrong, and a lot of us may be rushing too fast uh, into clinical trial designs that may be really suboptimal and really, unfortunately for the oncologists, could, could end up screwing us again because we don't have the best reputation in industry. Um, for lots of weird reasons, but the bottom line is, is that we have a, large, a, a lot of drugs and a very small funnel when it comes to radiation drug development. And, and part of it's our own problem and our own making. If you look at RTOG0522, which was the C225 chemo-RADS trial, it was a big fat bust. And if you look back at what we did preclinically, we didn't even answer the proper questions preclinically before we went barreling into a multi, multi, multi-million dollar trial, for right or for wrong. So it's just one cog of the problem of what we've done, which is typically, and I'll make this point over and over again, is that we do things preclinically and then ignore what we do preclinically or don't do the right things preclinically and then slap any drug we want that looks sexy onto a chemo radiation backbone over and over and over again. Okay? It's got to be cisplatin radiation. And then we just slap something else on. Or maybe slap two drugs onto that. Is that really what we want to keep doing in the box? So, I think you all know this pretty well here, that the five-year overall survival rates, in general, around 60% for the past few decades. We now know it's, it's all splitting off, right? So you have the HPV splitting off one way, and you have the HPV negative splitting off the other way, and we know where the problems are. We're all patting ourselves on the back when it comes to treating oral pharynx cancers, but when we're treating hypopharynx, larynx, oral cavity, we're all still struggling. Okay? Let's be honest here. Um, and, and you know what the breakdown is typically, but there's a fair amount of patients getting radiation, whether it's regional uh, disease spread or, or localized spread here. The majority of patients are locally advanced disease and head and neck cancer. It's such an interesting cancer. I mean, think about it when it compares to the lung. Our metastatic patterns are so different in the head and neck. We hardly ever get brain metastasis versus the lung. Our, our metastatic patterns are, are completely different. And many times it remains a local regional disease, but not all the time. So it's just a fascinating disease to study. Um, hopefully that yellow kind of wakes you up a little bit, but so, I mean, simply put, this is our box and we mix and match this, these things in our little toy box, but it's kind of the same thing over and over again. I, I didn't put the induction story in there. I didn't put accelerated radiation in there, but it's part of that same mix and we keep mixing them around, but we're not making that much more progress. And, and someone mentioned this at dinner, asked me at dinner last night, listen, have you guys peaked when it comes to radiation? Well, we're doing a lot of pretty neat things with proton therapy and IMRT and IMPT, uh, and intensity modulated proton therapy, and so on and so forth. And we're getting pretty fancy, and I'll, I'll show that in a second here. But I think in some respects, we are plateauing a little bit. Um, so I borrowed this from Ezra Cohen because I thought it was kind of neat. You know, that early stage disease, we do pretty good job with surgery, radiation, uh, and, and it's pretty easily curable when we talk about early stage vocal cord cancers or, or things like that. And then you have that locally advanced stage, but they're still curable, and we're still trying to find out what we should do optimally to, to cure those patients. And then we have the metastatic current patients that are incurable, maybe, maybe not now with immunologics. And can we become more creative with what we're doing here and, and think a little bit outside the box? So from a targeted radiation therapy, you know, we do targeted treatment, right? And group here has been one of the leaders in doing this with IMRT-based approaches here, and everyone knows some of the incredible things we can do now. Now, what Brian has shown is one of the best ways to mitigate toxicity with radiation, by the way, is, oops, I don't know what happened there. Anyway, one of the best ways to mitigate toxicity is don't treat. Areas don't need to treat. Huh, fancy that. It's amazing how a lot of people have forgotten especially young residents, understanding patterns of drainage in head and neck cancer. They understand, they can, they can pull up, the, I, I've had residents, you know, draw out their volumes and they'll draw out the level five lymph nodes and this and that and this and that and I go, so why did you draw these in? Why did you include these in Well, that's what Levendag says, the, the tables that shows where the lymph nodes are. I go, well, I know where the lymph nodes are, but does that mean the cancer's draining to those lymph nodes? No, they're not. Go back to the Lindbergh tables from 40, 50 years ago. Go back and look at the Gilbert and Fletcher textbooks. Go look at Sanguinetti's data at Hopkins. <clears throat> Understand patterns of drainage. That we've been way over treating a lot of areas that we don't need to treat. It's almost like we're back to the future again. We're publishing papers that go, oh, you don't need to treat the level five lymph nodes and 
majority of oral cancer cases, or you don't need to treat the RP nodes in, in oral cavity cancers, and this and that. Well, Brian's been saying that for years and years and years. You, you can treat ipsilaterally. You don't need to treat it, and that's one good way of decreasing radiation toxicity for sure. But we're doing a lot of other interesting things here. You know, our group, along with Nancy Lee and others, published on submandibular sparing. People thought, oh, you can't do that. Well, you've got a base of tongue cancer. You can't do submandibular sparing because it's definitely going to uh, transmit it to the 1B nodes. Well, guess what? majority of the base of tongue and tonsil cancers actually don't go into the 1B nodes. They go down into 2A, 2B, and so on and so forth. So we, we have probably... I haven't had a single failure in a 1B node. Now, Nancy, I do contralateral submandibular sparing. Nancy's actually been doing ipsilateral submandibular sparing, even if there's level 2B nodes positive. And she, I don't think, has had a failure. So we're trying to do some pretty interesting things with radiation. We're now doing prospective thyroid sparing. It always bugs me. Why are we blasting the thyroids? Can we actually curve around the thyroid glands now? So we're looking at that prospectively. And we're going to do some work with Sue Yoma, UCSF, and track that. But those are all little fancy things to do, you know, to, when you're bored in, in terms of technological achievements. But from an early stage standpoint, as I mentioned here, we all do a pretty good job. And if you look at the NCCN guidelines, typically surgery or, or, uh, or radiation alone is, is more than you need for things. And as you know, uh, RTRG 022, 0022, which doesn't get quoted much, by the way, is, was a reasonable trial of, of radiation alone. It's kind of an accelerated radiation approach at 2.2 gray per fraction, 66 gray for earlier stage oral pharynx cancers, non-selective for HPV status, but the two-year local regional control rate was 91%. I actually saw patients in the community when the induction story was so hot, okay, with T1... T2 N1 tonsils getting induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation. You got to be kidding me. I mean, and Brian's been saying all along, you don't need to do that. We've known that, but for some reason we forgot it for a while. And everyone was getting induction chemotherapy here. For early stage vocal cord cancers, we typically treat like many people at 2.2 gray, 2.25 gray per fraction to 63 or 65 gray. And we do pretty good, but there's a subset of T2 cancers that don't do so good. And I think we need to pay more attention to those. The bulkier T2 vocal cord cancers, we have a problem. We're only getting 75% local control. That's not good enough. So sometimes we'll add on sensitizer to those, depending if it's more than three cubic centimeters of tumor, we start to be hitting them a little more aggressively, especially if they have high levels of EGFR expression. When we talk about chemoradiation in head and neck cancer, everybody knows this paper. It, it's just so beautiful. I have to, I, I give Jean Borghese and, and, and their gang, uh, Blanchard and, and the group, so much credit for really digging into this and looking at this carefully in terms of, you know, what, where, where do we benefit? And I love the whack fact that they broke it down. But push comes to shove, any way you want to shake it, concomitant chemoradiotherapy has generally been the best way to get the best local regional control. Does that mean overall survival? No, it does not. Okay, and all I have to do is quote you the long-term results of RTOG 9111 to show you that there's no overall survival benefit when, when you whack people with somewhat unsophisticated radiation and big-time chemo. You don't always get the benefits from a survival standpoint. But nevertheless, when you look up and down the board here, whether it's induction chemotherapy or it's adjunct chemotherapy, those things really have never panned out. They just simply haven't panned out. We keep mixing that stew, but they still don't pan out. So concomitant gives us that, what, about 8% kick-up? Which, by the way, when you look at RTOG 9003, which looked at different ways of accelerating radiation with no chemo, what did you get when you got accelerated radiation with the Hanka? You could talk about that, where you give the six fractions per week, or you give the concomitant boost, where you give twice a day for the last 12 days, you do hyperfractionated, what do you, what do you get? 8% kick up. Pretty similar to chemo, right? But breaking it down here, the improvements were driven primarily by platinum. Now, interestingly enough, we really don't have a lot of information with the taxanes. But they're pretty powerful radio sensitizers as well. And finally, the RTOG and others are looking and comparing, dare I say, taxanes that cisplatin with radiation. Let's see what happens in RTOG 1216, which is the big high risk post op trial that's going to compare taxane, taxane cetuximab to cisplatin radiation. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I'm willing to bet anybody here a, a Tim Horton's donut or five that I'd like to have because it's so good this morning. Um, that taxing would be just as good as platinum in terms of local regional control. Uh, I have no doubt about that. So it'll be interesting to see meta-analysis when we start getting more studies with taxanes. But look, let's be honest. When you really look at larynx, when you look at hypopharynx, when you look at oral cavity, are you really getting even a 5% benefit? Barely. Barely. Okay? So we are still struggling in these heavy smoker areas 
still struggling with the locally advanced T3, T4s, and 2Bs, and 3s. And we're not going to get much more bang out of the buck adding in more chemo. We're doing induction chemo followed by chemo rads and things like that. So if you want to keep doing that for your career, God love you. But I think you're going to still be saying, showing the same results in 10 years. Okay? So, and part of the problem is the, is the toxicity. And, and that's, we know that. We're actually, I don't have time to show this, but we have a company I'm involved with um, that's going forward. We have a SBIR grant for a radio protector that we're going into phase one clinical trials with head and neck cancer that um, blocks NF kappa B and TGF beta and really seems to mitigate all radiation da damage to normal tissue. So we're going to go into that with some clinical trials with radio protectors to try to mitigate things like this. But nevertheless, this is a, this is a major problem. And it's not a pretty picture here when you look at the hazard ratios here in oral pharynx, or excuse me, in larynx, hypopharynx, oral cavity here in regards to uh, the deaths uh, with uh, chemo radiation versus uh, radiation alone. And, and this is part of the long-term deaths. Mitch McTay published on this that a fair amount of patients are dying for non-cancer related causes when we hit them with big time chemo radiation. Now we're getting better. There's no free lunch with IMRT, by the way. You still get a lot of acute side effects. The question is, can we block the constrictor muscles? Can we block the salivary tissue? Can we block the thyroid gland? Can we block major doses to the mandible? So two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, you're not having major problems with swallowing, <coughs> dental issues, all sorts of things like that. That's hopefully where we'll get the bang for the buck with IMRT. Um, but we have still a lot of knowledge gaps here. You know, we're still struggling in the head and neck arena. In contrast to lung, in contrast to colorectal cancer, we're still struggling with the, the, bio, the predictive biomarkers. P16 is a great prognostic marker, and it may be a predictive biomarker, but we're still struggling with finding all the other biomarkers. Now, in HPV-positive tumors, we're seeing, we're seeing the PI3K mutation story, right? And, and maybe that will be important in terms of helping us determine with HPV positives, who's really at risk for distance spread three to five years from now, because we're not seeing it at one to two years. So can we predict the HPV subtypes uh, that, that will help us decide who should get some kind of maintenance type therapy, maybe the immunologic type therapy, versus the ones that we know are going to be cured and we don't have to do anything about it. Where does, so where does the immunotherapy fit in? Where do the genomics fit in? Um, this was what I mentioned already, the long-term results of 9111, comparing the two things. And this gives me the thoughts, again, when I look at this over and over again, why we need to go in different directions and newer directions here. So, you know... Are we, this is not me as a child, <clears throat> um, are we willing to try new things? Are we willing to be bold enough to look in different directions? And, and, and convince our IRBs, by the way, that what we're doing is rational and makes sense and actually might have a better therapeutic ratio than what we're currently doing. Okay, so, so oral pharynx, I'm, I'm actually going to fly through these slides because I think you know this. It's a clearly evolving into two entities here, as you know, Right. And, and, and RTOG0129 showed this, uh, ECOG has showed this, uh, a variety of different studies have showed this over and over again, the, the massive split now in outcomes, okay, between low-risk patients, in other words, non-smokers, HPV positive, or pharynx, versus the heavy smoker, T3, T4, N2, B, N3 disease, okay? And, and I don't care what study you look at, everybody keeps showing the same curves, right? It's about a 30% split or so between those types of subgroups, uh, whether it's the induction chemo trials, the ECOG trials, the trial trials, it doesn't matter. It's all kind of coming out the same here in general. Um, and, and this remains true even in the post-operative setting as well. So maybe in the post-operative setting, the HPV-positive non-smokers, we can go in a completely different direction, and obviously many people are talking about that. Um, the mutational landscape of head and neck cancer is still kind of a, a black box. We're, still, we're starting to pick out a lot of interesting things with the wind signaling pathways and, and so on and so forth. We're looking at the fact that, uh, uh, that there's lower mutation rates in the HPV positive tumors and much higher mutation rates in the HPV negative tumors and, and more disruptive P53 mutations and things like that that maybe we can use to our advantage here in terms of as we break this down. And of course, uh, you know, Tangi and the group of Chicago is really doing some very nice work here breaking down the HPV positive subtypes here and starting to look at that not all HPV is created the same uh, and may be completely different from smokers to non-smokers here, and that there may be non-inflamed types versus inflammatory types. So the non-inflammatory phenotypes may not be the ones responding to immunologics, okay? Although maybe radiation can change that phenotype over to an inflammatory phenotype where they would then respond to an immunologic if they have metastatic disease. 
So, you know, radiation can be, as I like to call it, mama's milk uh, for the, you know, for immunologics potentially. So this is what you've generally seen. We're all trying to do this, right? You got groups in Europe, you got groups in Princess Margaret, you got groups in Colorado, all trying to combine, uh, what's the PIQK kinase inhibitor with radiation, or an mTOR inhibitor, or uh, you know, an EGFR inhibitor, or a hedgehog, or so on and so forth. And, and I just don't think we're making that much progress when we just combine it onto a chemoradiation backbone. But this is what you're going to start to see now is these combo studies with immunologics. And it's happening very, very fast. So first of all, let's look at inhibiting tumor-induced immunosuppression. It's a fascinating yin and yang story here. And, and the question is, does radiation, this is what you want to know, this is what I want to know, does radiation help immunologic therapy? Uh, it, you know, we, we treat so many different areas, so many patients get radiation. Is this an area that we can explore and start to look at in terms of increasing the appreciation for the interactions and ionizing radiation and altering the patient's immune system? And we've known this for years and years and years. We just didn't understand the mechanisms underlying it. So when we look at the mechanisms of immune-activated radiation in the tumor microenvironment and potentially in other parts of the body in terms of other tumor microenvironments, when we kill a cancer cell with radiation or chemotherapy and we're releasing tumor-related antigens and, and we're hopefully stimulating dendritic cells and looking at activating the adaptive and the effector immune responses here, can we get some benefits of that? Well, there is. I think you initially do get some benefits. The question is what happens after the initial benefits and is it the cancer stem cells and other issues that are, that are now then begin to create a tumor suppressive environment where things aren't working anymore. And We'll talk about this in a second, but is fractionated radiation a problem in terms of what we want to do for immunologic therapy? Or can we start to get clo closer and closer to more of a hyperfractionated approach, even for locally advanced disease, not just for metastatic disease? But it's a yin and yang in terms of the dual effect of radiation on the immune response. We see some suppression. We, lead, we see increases in TGF beta. We see increases in IL 10. Um, we see knocking out lymphocytes. And head and neck cancer. You know, we're all barreling forward with immunologic designs with radiation, but what are we still doing? We're treating the entire regional area with lymph nodes. Are we going to knock out all of the, the good TILs and the Tregs that we want, or the uh, T8 cells, CD8 cells coming in? Are we going to knock all those out and, and punch ourselves in the gut again and not make any progress? Is that the way we want to do it? Um, we do see some positive things in terms of stimulation here, in terms of necrosis factor related induction and interferon gamma. Can we use that to our advantage and stay away from the suppressive parts of it? But we do know that immunodeficiency, this goes back years and years and years and years and years when you, when you have new mice versus wild type in terms of an immune system or not, or you knock out, as I show here, or show here you knock out um, CD8, you don't get the tumor control. So we know that immunodeficiency in general, and if you've ever treated an immunodeficient patient with renal transplant, with skin cancers growing like crazy, um, or, or a person who has uh, suppression of uh, their CD4 counts because they're HIV positive, they just don't seem to respond as well to radiation. So we know that immunodeficiency abrogates the effects of radiation. Um, and we know that we're learning more about the blockade of the PDE1 story or PDL1 story and CTL4 story in terms of or these checkpoint inhibitors suppressing inflammation as well, or I should say suppressing the immune response as well, whether it's preventing the adaptive response here or, or preventing the effective response here, uh, whether it's PDL1 expression on the tumor or PD1 expression here uh, on, the, on the T cells. So, does radiation positively impact PDL1? So, if you look at head and neck cancer, but it, it varies between the different disease sites. What we're seeing, and, and uh, uh, Lillian can, you know, she's a PI on a very important study looking at PDL1 inhibitors. What is the level of PDL1 expression on head and neck tumors? Now, it depends on what assay you use, right? But in general, it doesn't seem to me, at least when I look at it, not more than 20%, 15% PDL1 positive expression in metastatic head and neck cancer. So you've got a lot of PDL1 negative tumors here. Does radiation amplify or uplift the expression of PDL1? And if it does, how long does it do it for? These are questions we don't know. In the laboratory, at the very least, if you look across the board of different investigators looking at this story, it seems that radiation does upregulate PDL1 expression here. And, and that's across different tumor models here. And, and so is that really the, in a way, the way to get around the immunosuppression by using the radiation? 
whether it's in one lesion, whether it's several lesions, whether it's in locally advanced disease, can we amplify PDL1 expression and look at this? And there are people who are looking at this. Sarah Pai at, at Harvard is looking at this in patients who have locally recurred and they're resecting the tumors and looking at the PDL1 expression and going back and looking at what the original PDL1 ex expression was prior to radiation. So can we help PDL1 inhibition by jacking it up in tumors that normally didn't express it? And so radiation, we know, combined with anti-PD-1 immunotherapy improves local control. This is just one of many slides I can show you from Sharabi, from uh, Dovidi, from uh, Wexelbaum, from a variety of different groups. We have, we have data like this at Colorado showing that anti-PD-1 or anti pd one therapy with radiation is quite dramatic in terms of its tumor control. And by the way, I like to see tumor regression in my animal models. There's a lot of animal model slides where you see where it just slowed down the tumor growth, but it keeps going. That's not real exciting to me. And yet a lot of people can't wait to go barely into a clinical trial with, with slight slowdown in tumor growth, and then you see it taken off again. I like to see actually tumor suppression, and I like to see flat lines of tumors. That's always kind of a positive thing to me. <clears throat> um, and, but if you look at this, uh, when you knock out or deplete the CD8 cells, you abolish the effectiveness of the combination of radiation and anti-PDL1. This was not the case with CD4 depletion, but definitely the case when you blocked CD8. And, and, and blocking CD8 restored the, the uh, uh, myeloid uh, uh, suppressor cells. And so when you combine with PDL1 and you have CD8, you don't get you, you block the MDSCs and you see very, very nice tumor regression. <coughs> There's really a lot of questions with IMRT and radiation preclinical models that we haven't answered yet. And we have to do this. We've got to do the right preclinical studies to feel more comfortable about the clinical designs we're doing. Because I'm already seeing a big disconnect with what we're doing preclinically and what I'm seeing in clinical trial designs from around the world. And full disclosure, I'm doing a six-month sabbatical now with AstraZeneca, and I did this seven years ago. I try to take a sabbatical every seven years. I really try to walk away. And I'm involved with their immunologic teams that had neck cancer and helping to devise strategies around the world. So I, I'm seeing all the ESRs, the LOIs coming in from around the world and the clinical trials. And I'm absolutely fascinated on how people are thinking and the disconnects that I'm seeing from the preclinical. So one, can we replicate what we do in the clinic? What should we treat? If we're just talking about head and neck cancer, should we treat just the gross disease? Can we get away with that if we're, or if we're going to combine it with immunologics? If we believe on what immunologics are doing, how do we sequence it? Is hypofractionation better? Can we treat a head and neck patient with SBRT, a locally upfront? And we have done that at Colorado for patients living 150, 200 miles away who simply can't stay for seven weeks. We'll do SBRT, and we, especially with HPV positives, and we see wonderful effects, and they do, they do quite nicely. Can we do that? Is the abscopal effect real? Sorry, dare I say it, do we need chemotherapy? Can we go in a different direction? What are the toxicities? Can we replicate these in animal models here? Um, we know that chemotherapy can actually diminish radiation-mediated control of tumors. And Ralph Flexbaum and others have shown this, that when you give chemotherapy after the radiation, you can actually negate the effects of the radiation. So somehow there's this yin and yang here and, and a negative effect on the tumor microenvironment in terms of immune suppression. But this is what we always do. We see adverse reactions here when, when we look and give it in paclitaxel after radiation, after 15 grade radiation here, we do surgery, then we give chemotherapy, and we abrogate the, the decrease in metastatic expression, and you get increased met metastatic expression when you start doing this. So th there's a problem with that. We know that local radiation increases CD8 T cell infiltration. We certainly know that in the animal models. Do we know that in the, in the head and neck clinic, though, if we're treating the entire head and neck area with all the lymph node basins? That could be a problem, okay? So, but we do know that, that, that CD8 cells go up and we see in, increased infiltration, macrophase infiltration, and radiation initially. Long-term radiation abolishes that CD8 T cell mediated anti-tumor immunity. So is fractionation bad? So I'm already seeing clinical trial designs now because it's standard of care, okay? And the IRBs won't accept anything else, or CTEP might not accept anything else. We've got to do what? 70 grade radiation, cisplatin, treating all the lymph nodes, and now we're just going to add on immunologics. Is that really going to mess us up? Is that the right way to do it? Because we see that long extended radiation, depending on the models you look at, actually may be uh, counterintuitive and may, and may actually hurt what we're trying to achieve. And this is kind of a, a Mark McCrit didn't let me borrow the slide here in terms of looking at conventional fractionation, what happens with cancer cells, except for maybe the stem cells, 
And what happens with macrophage infiltration, but what happens with the T cells in regards to it as, as we get past three, four weeks of radiation therapy, you start seeing a down regulation of things that we want to see. And she's shown quite nicely that hypofractionation will preserve the immune cells here. And this is, this is conventional fractionation here uh, versus hypofractionation here. And seeing the increase in CD8 cells and, and or decrease in the CD8 cells here with the conventional, more drawn out uh, uh, radiation fractionation pattern. So conclusion so far. We need CD8 cells to help us with radiation to be maximally effective. CD4 cells are, are important as well but not as important as CD8 cells. The abscopal effect, regression distant from radiation field happens, but it's still rare in practice. We talk about it a lot, we throw that word around a lot, but have we really proven it in a prospective fashion yet in the clinic? No, we have not. Large dose radiation may increase the anti-tumor immunity. Everyone keeps saying that in that, that sweet spot, maybe eight grade times three, eight grade times four, something like that, where you're getting around a certain part of the cell survival curve, but a different kind of tumor antigen release versus the slow two grade per fraction kind of deal that we typically do in the clinic. And chemotherapy may actually be har harmful in this situation here. Certainly could be dependent on the experimental system, but it's a good cautionary note to think about. So ways of doing things. Can we remo remove the cloaking device that cancers use? Can we use IMRT and radiation therapy and recruit the, 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 the proper types of, excuse me, the proper types of, T cells and activation of effector cells here by releasing of antigens or cytokines, the CXCL16 that recruits CXCR6 and CD8 cells and activates them to prime them against tumors here and tumors that are radiated. Can we look at radio protection? So we've been using a poor man's radio protector to reverse fibrosis for years and years with Trental and vitamin E after radiation. Should we actually be giving it during the radiation? That's a poor man's TGF beta, but we're actually have a TGF beta TKI in the lab that we're working with. And we're going to look at combining that with PDL1, anti pdl one in a humanized mouse model system, a PDX model system that has humanized bone marrow to start looking at the interactions of TGF theta suppression and what it does in terms of cross priming or, or uh, turning on the, uh, the immune effector uh, cells. <coughs> what about some new twists? Von der Heide's group and others have done some pretty neat things by looking at removing macrophages and, and uh, giving them low dose radiation ex vivo, and then infiltrating them back in, seeing these massive responses uh, in their pancreatic tumor models here that are very, very exciting. So there are all sorts of interesting ways to manipulate the immune system here, uh, leading to, you know, in their, in their system, a pretty remarkable extension of survival in their pancreatic models that are leading to go into clinical trials. So they seem to be replicating what their clinical trial design is, what they're showing preclinically here. What about pressing on the gas? We talked about this last night with things like CD137 or OX40. So can we press on the gas with immune stimulation in certain areas, and can we uh, use the checkpoint inhibitors to block the immune suppression on the other side here? So co-stimulation. And, and you're seeing this very rapidly already into clinical trial designs you know, with the, the use of OX40, with the use of CD137. It's, it's happening so fast, it's really remarkable, and, and we hope to design some clinical trials at AstraZeneca that will look at co-stimulation with radiation. And if you look at some of the models that have been done here, and, and this is some of the work with Ralph's thing, combining or co-stimulation with anti-CD137 and anti-PD1 with radiation gave clearly best anti-tumor control and also created an immune memory uh, situation when re-challenged. So I think this is going to be very interesting. So the question is, before we go barreling into clinical trials, should we take this and now compare this to cisplatin radiation backbone in, in a variety of head and neck tumors, maybe three or four head and neck tumors that are well characterized for either P53 mutations, P16 positivity or negativity, and, and we know where they, they came from. Were they for heavy smokers? What's their EGFR status, non-EGFR status? And look at chemo RADs versus combo immunologics and radiation and compare the two and see what we get. And if, if it's strongly positive in this direction, are we bold enough then to go into clinical trials that will actually compare versus just adding on to the standard of care? which is what we all feel like we have to do ethically sometimes, when scientifically that may not be the best way to do it. So I'm staying on time, so it's looking good. Hopefully I'm not putting anybody to sleep yet. Um, I think this is important data because, and, and I'd, I'd love to hear Lillian's comments about this too, in terms of the effects or the pseudo-progression story that we keep hearing about when we give uh, different IOs. And so you guys have all probably seen this picture. I'm sorry to do this early in the morning if you've got a donut and coffee, but... 
but we're getting reports around the world of these kinds of situations where initially it looks like there's tumor progression. And in fact, if you just take a pause back and take a breath and watch it carefully and manage the symptoms, it actually turns into tumor regression uh, with the immunologic approaches here within three months. And we've seen this, I've seen this, uh, these types of things ad nauseum. And what we've heard reports, and, and maybe Lillian can comment on this, is patients who are getting the immunologic therapies, especially the combination therapy, anti-CDL4, anti-PDL1, they're getting edema. What does the edema mean? How do you manage it? Is it life-threatening? What do you do? Do you need to, one patient needed to be trait over in Europe? Things like that. Is, but is it a bad thing? If you're getting the swelling. Now, what I want to know is, is most of the swelling occurring in patients who have been surgerized. In other words, if they've had big neck dissections and things don't drain that well anyway and they get infiltration, are those the ones who are getting all the, in, the, the swelling? Is the swelling everywhere? Is the swelling just on one side where the tumor recurrence is? This is a really fascinating story here in terms of what we're trying to understand about this. And I don't know, Lillian, if, you, if you've seen this um, and, and what your impression is of this and, and you know, your thoughts on managing it. Do you give them steroids right away? Do you keep them on steroids and then, then re-challenge them with the next dosing of the anti pdl one But this is an evolving story that we're all trying to learn about and understand it head and neck, okay, specifically. Um, but, but we've all seen this thing here in terms of the patient responses and, and you, see, you know, very nice responses here. Uh, with a variety of different tumors here, uh, shrinking pretty quickly uh, in terms of patient response. It doesn't seem to matter, at least with the PD-1 uh, Pembrolizumab study, whether you're HPV positive or HPV negative. Okay, uh, this is one of the studies here that Bob Ferris is a PI on with Lisa Lucitra uh, at AstraZeneca, and, and this is a variety of different studies going on. But the interesting part about this study is including patients who have failed within six months of chemo radiation. Is and, and stratifying based on PDL1 positive, PDL1 negative disease, this gives you an, a chance to look at a combo study versus monotherapy. So it's PDL1 alone, anti PDL1 alone versus anti PDL1 plus anti CTL4. So we're, we're really trying to get moving on, uh, and I, this is occurring in all different groups and different companies, this combination approach here. And then, as I mentioned before, the co stimulatory approach as well, which I think you'll be seeing in a theater close to you pretty soon. This is the first line study that is opening around the world here that's going to go head to head against extreme. I, I don't know the feeling of extreme here, but extreme is not a popular regimen in the United States. Not at all. And most people do not follow the extreme regimen. They will mix and match a little bit and modify and maybe give a little bit of taxanes plus C225, do a little carbo dance, you know, things like that. Everybody's kind of mixing and matching, but there's not, I don't run around the United States seeing a lot of people can't wait to give extreme. So this is, I think, a bold move and a risky move, but a move where they're going to challenge extreme versus just adding to extreme. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens here. I, I, I'm going to be fascinated to see how this turns out. What about in the clinical setting here? So God love uh, the Pittsburgh group because I thought this was a very bold move. Okay, we're doing combinations of tuximab and olaparib, a PARP inhibitor. They did combinations of tuximab radiation, and this is based in part on Bob's preclinical work showing that maybe cetuximab is the right thing to combine with immunologics. And let's be honest, what is cetuximab? Maybe what it really is, is a poor man's immunologic agent, an ADCC activator rather than an EGFR inhibitor. <laughs> I mean, and maybe the chimerization of the antibody is what you need. You, as my brother likes to say, maybe you need a little mouse in your house uh, to, to stimulate that immune reaction. But, but nevertheless... He, this is, I think, a bold phase one study. Now, they had to back off on Uruboy because they saw a lot of, uh, outside of the radiation field, a lot of rash that was really amplified. So they had to back off the ipilimumab dose. So I know they've accrued probably at least 12, 11 or 12 patients now. So it would be really interesting to see how this plays out. But it's a bold move on starting to get away from the cisplatin backbone and start to look at immunologic and targeted agents together, which I think is also a fascinating story. And you're seeing this happen very rapidly. In fact, Amanda Siri in Greece is going to be doing a study combining Olaparib with pd one And you're going to see that definitely in ovarian cancer. Uh, so there's, there's a lot, you're going to see a lot of interesting combos with targeted agents plus immunologic therapies and how that's going to play out. And are those targeted agents good immunologic stimulation for better activation or better response to anti PD1 or PDL1 or CTL4. Um, this is the trial design uh, as it currently stands in the RTOG. So, you know, it's always interesting for me to hear what your opinion is going to be. It's going to be a very interesting study. 
You get cetuximab radiation if you're P16 positive, for right or for wrong. You're going to get cisplatin if you're P16 negative, for right or for wrong. And you're going to get combinations of that with nivolumab. So it's, it's a run-in safety, but we're going to give the nivolumab during beginning and during the radiotherapy and for, for uh, maintenance afterwards. Okay. Now, some people, and you've seen the lung studies and other studies where they're giving this, the stuff after chemoradiation. That's a sequencing question, right, that we haven't really carefully answered in the lab. There's only one guy I know so far, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, who's published, uh, Dovidi's group has published out of Manchester looking at sequencing. When to give the PD-1 or the PD-L1? Do you give it at the beginning of the radiation? Do you give it during the radiation? Or do you give it after the radiation? Which is better? They clearly showed in their animal model that giving it five days after the end of radiotherapy, you saw no benefits. When you gave it at the beginning or as a primer and during the radiotherapy, massive benefits. We need more of that preclinical question to be answered more carefully. Okay? <clears throat> what is the best way to do it? And with chemoradiation. So if you do chemoradiation in preclinical with cisplatin radiation for head, neck, or lung model, do the sequencing study. Now, the Pacific trial is the lung trial that's being done in AstraZeneca that did chemoradiation and then they randomized the placebo versus PD-L1. It's going to be very interesting to see that giving the PD-L1 afterwards, what happens? Do you get any benefit at all? So that's a very important. So this is, give, is giving concurrently. But it's still conventional fractionation. It's still treating all the typical lymph nodes we're treating. Is that going to burn us in that respect? Excuse me, I hate to use that word as radiation colleges, but is that, is that going to hurt us? Should we be doing something a little bit differently? The abscopal effect, we all ask ourselves, it's a sexy word, we throw it around a lot. Maybe we should be using bystander effect or some other kind of word. That, but it sounds sexy. Maybe it really happens. Maybe it doesn't really happen. It'll be interesting to know. Maybe it's based on the phenotype. But... With the tumor release, you know, with the tumor release or the antigen release, does it change the microenvironment here? Activate the lymph nodes, lead to immune response into different areas that are that are in contrast from where the primary. And everybody who's seen this picture had nausea, so I won't spend a lot more time on this. But they had had ipilimumab first, then they got progression, then they get SPRT, and then they all of a sudden started seeing regression in other areas. Okay, so this piqued everybody's interest and got everybody going. So. There's a lot of designs around the world. I was telling a group last night at dinner that uh, Gustav Roussy is going to do an SBRT trial in, in metastatic head, neck, lung, esophagus, looking at SBRT and biopsying lesions outside of the radiation field to see if there's changes in the tumor microenvironment and infiltration of CD8 cells into those non-radiated tumors. But you're going to see designs like this very fast through the NRG, through ECOG and others that are going to look at giving IM, IMRT, uh, excuse me, SBRT with immunologic therapy and looking at whether there really is an abscopal effect in patients who have oligometastatic disease. Um, this is a duck. <laughs> um, <laughs> so benefits of biologics and radiation. We've seen this slide over and over and over and over again, right? Uh, when did we publish this? What, about 10 years ago? Has anyone seen us get a drug approved by the FDA with radiation since this in a phase three study. Anybody? I haven't seen one. That's pretty bad. That's a pretty crappy track record. So we have cetuximab with radiation. Went from a phase one. I, I treated the first three patients with Sharon Spencer in Alabama with cetuximab and radiation in the phase one trial. And then that's probably the first time you're, the last time you're ever going to see a phase one go right to a phase three. And interestingly enough, at that time, chemoradiation was not considered standard of care I, I hesitate to date myself in 1995, 96, but so we went into a phase three trial with cetuximab radiation versus radiation alone. We didn't have the cisplatin. Now, we all know what happened when we added cisplatin radiation to cetuximab. We saw no benefit whatsoever. And that's the same with penitumumab. Saw no benefit whatsoever. The concert trials. So this is all we have. And we've been sitting on this and sitting on this and sitting on this, and we're not making a lot of progress. This was the extreme study. You guys know it probably pretty well, so I don't need to go through all the rigmarole of the design and things like that, but it was with and without cetuximab. And this was the breakdown that got approval and FDA approval. So you got, what, about a three-month benefit that got approval? Not a lot. A lot of toxicity. This was the 0522 trial here. I don't know what else to say. It was negative in every way, shape, or form. Okay? 
And I don't know if you saw this very interesting editorial breaking it down. What went wrong? What did we do wrong here? Did we really do the right preclinical studies here that really answer the questions that, that led to this? Or did we just, again, assume that adding on a biologic onto a chemo radiation backbone would be the savior of race, and it wasn't? Okay, so Michigan's group wrote a very nice paper here looking at this, eliminating chemotherapy by a dual target approach with radiation. Now, this, is, this came out before we really started dancing around the immunologic story, but still, it's still the same provocative story that I think we should all be talking about in terms of getting out of our box of comfort here. Okay, can we choose different agents that either attack the same pathway with two different molecules to increase the overall inhibition? or choose two agents that block different pathways simultaneously, or block a resistance pathway that gets amplified by blocking the initial pathway, can we do those kinds of things here? And, and so we looked at, at Colorado at exploiting DNA repair deficits to enhance the effects of epidermal growth factor receptor inhibition and radiation. Where did we look for it? I, I decided, look, I don't want to explore the HPV positive tumors. They don't have a lot of mutations, not a lot of smokers. Where is the real problem? It's the heavy smokers. Where are the patients who are going to have most of the mutations? The heavy smokers. Where are the patients who are going to have the most DNA repair issues? The heavy smokers. Okay, where are the ones that are failing the most? The heavy smokers. Okay, when you're getting a 43% overall survival in RTOG0129 with accelerated chemo radiation, by the way, at three years, what does that tell you? That's, that's pretty poor. So I thought it would be interesting to study that group of patients here and we know that the, the, the DNA repair mechanisms go through a variety of different pathways, whether it's homologous or non-homologous recombination, are there ways to exploit this. So non-homologous recombination is kind of the, I look at it as the dirty way to fix DNA. Slap and kick and dirty and let's, let's, let's get moving. Okay? And then you have the homologous approach here that, and, and by the way, so the, th this is related to PARP activation, which was interesting to me. We all know that you have repair of single strand breaks, repair of double strand breaks, base excision repairs, and it's all an interactive process that's going on very fast. This is homologous recombination, requires more of an intact homologous DNA sequence to fix the double strand breaks, and it's a little bit more complicated process. It has to be cleaner, and these are some of the, the breakdowns in terms of looking at the BRCA story here and RAD51 story. So we decided, could we leap into the unknown a little bit here? And when we designed this about three or four years ago, it was almost blasphemous to even mention this. And I remember getting dirty looks by outside reviewers when we were looking at this potentially approach and, and looking at blocking EGFR pathway with cetuximab and combining it with radiation, knowing that radiation is going to amplify PARP, could we then look at PARP inhibition at the same time? And, and what's the best way to do that? We knew that, and I was, and this is why you take sabbaticals, by the way. So seven years ago, I was in Manchester, England, working with AstraZeneca, and I got a chance to go down to Cambridge and meet with Mark O'Connor and Jim Carmichael, who were working with Laparib, and getting a sense of, I asked him, what kind of problems are you running into with this drug? As a monotherapy, it was like taking water. It's unbelievable. 400 milligrams BID, it's, it's unbelievably non-toxic. But when you combine it with chemotherapy, you had serious myelosuppression. So when I was designing our trial that I'll talk about in a second here, I wanted to stay away from that problem. The last thing I wanted to do was kill off our study with big myelosuppression problems. And that's what I've seen, by the way, in other studies where they've hit with cisplatin or temozolomide or others, they've seen big myelosuppression problems with true DNA repair inhibitors, okay, PARP inhibitors. So that gave me a clue there by taking that sabbatical and spending some time with the scientists that when I designed my clinical trial, we could stay away from it. And also... What dose could you give with a lapro when you combine it with radiation? Do you need to give anywhere near the monotherapy doses? I suspected not, and we started with a much lower dose, and we used a tight CMR, CRM model. So there's a lot of different drugs out there that are looking at PARP inhibition here, and we're studying the AZ compound, 2281, that's been FDA approved recently for ovarian. And when we saw combining a gefitinib and a laparib in head, neck, and a variety of different lines, and just, just two of probably 23 head and neck lines that we fingerprinted uh, that we have in our lab, uh, we saw very, very strong synergy combining EGFR inhibition with the lab. And this is similar to what the NKI group is seeing. We also saw uh, increase in H2X uh, uh, demonstration with just small doses of radiation here. We also looked at it with cisplatin. So I added cisplatin in the board, and I don't see that much benefit of adding cisplatin. But I did. Okay? It starts getting complicated. It starts getting expensive, especially when you're talking about animal models. But you need to do it. And you need to understand, what is the interaction of cisplatin? If that's what you do in the clinic, then look at it in the laboratory. 
And so, but, but it was pretty remarkable when you combine cetuximab and elaprid with radiation, with low dose radiation here, the effects that, that we got. We saw increased senescence, uh, amplification of P21, and the, and the best combinations with cetuximab, elaprid, and radiation. And when we did an animal study, this is just one, we're, we're going to go back and do some of the other studies where we're going to look at cisplatin radiation with and without elaprid. But I compared the doublet of elaprid cetuximab radiation to cisplatin radiation. Much, much better. But that's still not good enough. And by the way, these cost seven to $10,000 a pop. It's not fun to spend all this money, but you really need to do this. And so we're going we're we're to do chemo radiation plus elaborate, compare it to the doublets with radiation, and look at the different sequencing to confirm that what we're doing we think is the right thing to do. And this is the RT, RT4, the time for quadrupling the tumor volume when you combine the doublets of EGFR inhibition, elaboration, and radiation versus the other combinations. Are there predictive biomarkers? Not yet. Or we know BRCA1 is an important story, but head and neck, BRCA1 hasn't been an important story. So SMAD4, is that an interesting biomarker? Many of the, the head and neck heavy smoker tumors are SMAD4 deficient, driving through the TGF beta pathway. So maybe that's a pathway that will be predictive. At least some of our preclinical work suggests, in fact, in SMAD4 deficient cells here, they're very sensitive to elaborate. So we're looking at that in our head and neck phase one trial here. When we abrogated uh, SMAD4 or put it back in and restored it, we saw the sensitivity or, or resistance go up or down based on that. So it was consistent. So this is our phase one study here. And I just want to show you a couple tumors here, a diagnosis. This is an epiglottic base of tongue tumor here. And this is a supraglottic larynx tumor. So this is before we gave them anything. We gave them 10 days of elaborate prior to beginning radiotherapy. We started at 50 milligrams BID, and we were using a tight CM, CRM model. What we've seen, which was my gut all along, was that you probably don't need more than 25 daily or 25 BID of elaborate to get the strong radiation effects. And that's exactly what they're seeing at the NKI in the Netherlands with lung cancer and breast cancer. Down to 25 daily, and they had to get rid of the cisplatin nerve study. And they're still seeing remarkable responses. So that will be published in the near future. But this is before. So this is oncetuximab and olaparib prior to beginning the radiotherapy. We are already seeing very nice responses, and the patients were already telling us, my pain has gone down significantly. So we, we wanted to see that kind of response up front. So this, again, is that diagnosis. This is day six of radiation up here. So the tumor is shrinking quite quickly. This is pretreatment, and the guy had a bulk load of tumor going up and down the pharyngeal wall base of tongue. We gave him a lap of radiation, cetuximab, and this is what it looks five, whoops, five months post. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, and I'll tell you, and this is why you follow patients, and, and this is for drug development, for young radiation oncologists. You know, if you think medical oncology, you're thinking acute side effects during the treatment. So you're thinking acute side effects during the radiation, and once you get past 30 to 90 days, you're good to go. No, you're not good to go. You need to follow those patients carefully. At six months, we, saw, we looked in his throat. The tumor was gone. He had all this necrosis going up and down his pharyngeal wall on the left side. And I'm like, oh my God, is this all tumor recurrence? I'm like, God, this does not look like tumor recurrence. This does not look like tumor recurrence. Biopsied it once, biopsied it twice, biopsied it a third time, no tumor, all just necrotic dead tissue. He had to put a feeding tube back in him. He couldn't swallow. Then eventually it started healing, slowly but surely. By 10 or 11 months, it had all healed, pulled the feeding tube out, and he was good to go. So I've got five minutes. You need to go. <laughs> I should go back to that picture. Um, but I want to thank Lillian for having me here because it's uh, been a great experience so far. I saw Lillian for five minutes, but it's been the one of the most exciting five minutes. <laughs> Unbelievably interactive, lots of exchange of ideas. It's amazing. I can't wait for the next invitation. For uh, so I, I just wanted to show you the skin reactions too here. So this is... <clears throat> At 1470, primarily within the field, nothing unexpected, nothing crazy. This was at 6300 centigrade, not too crazy. But I have had a couple patients at the end of radiotherapy or starting a week after radiotherapy to get big skin reactions. Now, I've been doing skin sparing for 10 years, so I know that this is an amplified reaction with the PARP inhibitor and cetuximab because I normally never get lots of skin breakdown anymore. So if you lost weight, and we did not have adaptive radiotherapy into this trial, so our phase two trial will have adaptive radiotherapy. 
So if they're losing any weight, we'll snap in everything and keep that skin reaction down as much as we can. Also, when we dropped down to 25 BID, we saw a lot less problems. But this is the kind of thing, now they healed up and they did fine. But, but we saw this one to two weeks after radiotherapy. It was quite significant. Okay, that's like old school. Remember back then, 15 years ago, when we were just doing opposed laterals with four or six MD photons, that's what we saw. Okay, we, we don't see that as much with IMRT-based approaches, but I was definitely seeing that with the PARP inhibitor. So these are the different trials that are going on around the world with PARP inhibitors and radiation. Just kind of give you a whistle stop, whether it's the SWAG trial, the Netherlands trial, what they're doing concurrently, and dropping the chemo because there was too much toxicity. What did they see in their lung trial? Six months, just like I saw with the six months on the pharyngeal wall, they started seeing esophageal strictures at six months. They didn't use esophageal constraints, and they, and they included big fields in the esophagus, and they saw major strictures. When they dropped the cisplatin, they stopped seeing that, and they start, when they modified the protocol to have esophageal constraints. But it's so critical to follow those patients six months out, a year out. It's not good enough to stop after the radiation is done and go, ah, this is great, this is safe. Okay, or as, or as one of my mentors once said, radiation is the gift that keeps on giving. Okay, <laughs> so as I wrap up here, out of the box, can we look at hypofractionated radiation for these patients? Can we treat only gross disease? Can we potentially remove the chemotherapy and add in combinations? Should we be doing maintenance chemotherapy in the local advanced setting or maintenance uh, immunologics? How long? How long is a patient going to handle maintenance? Everybody keeps writing in these protocols. We're going to give them 12 months or two years of maintenance therapy in a locally advanced setting. I keep seeing those LLIs. Really? Really? If you're a patient, are you, is that what you're going to do? We don't really know. So some people are clamoring for just six months of maintenance immunologics. We, we don't know the answer. Okay? These are all important sequencing issues that we're going to have to deal with and try to understand. Should we just design a randomized trial in head and neck right now? If you pin me down for a clinical trial right now, should I do... Radiation, let's say chemo radiation for locally advanced disease, heavy smokers, with anti PD1 or anti PD01, and compare it to chemo radiation and give the PD1 afterwards. Straight up, randomized phase two sequencing question. It answers one question that we don't know the answer to sequencing. Is that a reasonable trial design? I don't know. Okay. So, should we do combination right off the bat? CTL4 is a primer with the, at the beginning with. PDL1 and then just do the PDL1. So there's so many variations that we can do. So I want to thank Barb Frederick, XJ, uh, who's the head of our basic research head and neck program, Antonio Meno. Uh, we've got some pretty incredible animal models that we're using to answer some of these questions and, and explore new questions with. And, and so it's just, we have a really fun group to collaborate. Not as fun as these guys, but, uh, but a really nice group to work. So <laughs> I would say, you know, it's not crazy to think out of the box. It's not crazy to start pushing the envelope a little bit because I, I, I go back as I pointed out at the beginning of the talk. What are our benefits with high-dose platinum radiotherapy or TPF induction followed by chemo radiotherapy or things like that? What are the real big benefits? Are we seeing 15 to 20% or 30% benefit that we saw in nasopharynx? No, we're not. So it is time to trust what we're doing preclinically, do the right things preclinically, and then design the clinical trials based on that preclinical data to say, can we get out of the box and try something new here? So with that, I'll stop. And I stopped two, I probably should have stopped 10 minutes early. I apologize, but I did stop before 9 o'clock. One minute. <laughs> so. One question. That's why I did this. There wouldn't be any questions. <laughs> Yeah. So as an IV person for biomarker, for biotherapy, do you think that for your PDL1, do you think that it's actually crucial to test PDL1 expression before giving the drug, or you can give it? So that's the that's the critical question in the metastatic setting. In the locally advanced setting, depending on what we're seeing in the lab, and so far everybody seems to see amplification of PDL1 on the tumors with radiation, will it matter? In other words, will all of them start to show PDL1 expression if you're radiating the tumor? I don't know. So maybe, maybe, maybe we just don't even think about it and we just give everybody a, a combo of PDL1 CTL4 together, but just one or two doses of CTL4. So you're just priming the tumor, but don't give them the, the little toxic long-term CTL4 that leads to all the colitis and all the other issues. 
Maybe that's what we do. Maybe in a local advance, we just use it as a quick primer with PD-L1 at the beginning to maybe convert all the tumors. One of the different, uh, there's a couple of designs from MD Anderson and a couple others that they're going to do PDL1 or PDL1 CTL4, and then they're going to take them to surgery. So they're going to do a window trial, which we absolutely need. They're going to go to surgery, then we're going to get to see right off the bat what percentage were PDL1 positive at the beginning, what percentage were PDL1 positive after four weeks or two or four weeks of immunologic. That's a critical study. Yeah. So you mentioned SBRT as a strategy for reducing the immunosuppressive effects of, radi of fractionated radiation. But even with fractionated radiation, should we be considering, say, very high dose rate radiation to avoid that? Say, flattening filter-free radiation to avoid the immunosuppressive um, lymphocyte? Give me an example. Well, so we treat maximum of 600 monitor units per minute, right? But but with flattening filter-free, for example, with SBRT, we go up to 2,400 or higher per minute. Wouldn't that be a way to avoid the lymphocytoxic effect? I don't know. I think it's, that's, uh, that's the first I've heard of that. I mean, I think, to me, it still gets down to volume. I, I really believe that, that treating all the lymph node basins is the big mistake, uh, potentially the big mistake. But it depends on the volume of blood that's flowing through the Absolutely. area that's treated. So Absolutely. So if you treat like that then you have a very limited volume. Absolutely. No, that's a really, really interesting question. And that's the first I've heard of anyone talking about that. I mean, we know that low-dose rate radiation, or I call it stealth radiation, doesn't jack up RAD51, doesn't jack up ATM, so you don't turn on DNA repair pathways. But that's a whole different story than what you're talking about. And I think that's really, really interesting. I mean, that's something I don't know if it can be replicated in the laboratory as a question. I, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, because people know. have modeled that, like the blood volume that flows through Correct. Right, seven weeks. Correct. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Wow. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm sure David will take any questions from anyone off, offline. Yeah, and thank you again for letting me go through a barrel of slides, but there's, there's so much story to tell in so many interesting areas that hopefully pique your interest and get the young investigators here doing some of those interesting preclinical models that I, I know you have access to here. So. Thanks very much for, uh, for uh, giving me your ideas.